Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly Beatles podcast in which we talk about everything to do with the Beatles, their music, their history, anything we feel like talking about in the moment. I'm Ken Michaels, also known for my syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing, and my other podcast show, a solo Beatles video podcast called Talk More Talk. And on today's show, I'm being joined by my regulars, Alan Cozen, the author of such Beatle books as From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. Also, it's a writer formerly for the New York Times for their classical department, currently for the Wall Street Journal and other publications. And then there's my other co-host, Darren DeVivo, who's been on New York's WFUV for the past 35 years. For today's broadcast, we're not recording it from our own studios. We are, in fact, playing back a panel discussion that we had over the weekend on November 10th at Monmouth University in New Jersey for their Wide Album International Symposium which had uh, noted Beatles authors, historians, experts, musicians, and fans all getting together to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the release of the Beatles White Album with panels, uh, special events, and even performances. What you're about to hear is our panel discussion called The White Album, Was It the Beatles at Their Peak or Past Their Peak? And it was a lively talk, and you'll get to hear all of our opinions on this subject. I must caution you that when it came time to take questions from the audience, the audio from them got pretty low when that happened. I had to boost the volume up quite a bit, and you may struggle to hear everything that was said, but that was the best I could do in those instances. So sit back and enjoy this conversation from the White Album Symposium, here on Things We Said Today. This is the Things We Said Today podcast panel. I'm Alan Cozen. Uh, next to me is Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York. And next to him is Ken Michaels, who has his own show, Every Little Thing, and is on another podcast as well that also has a panel at this uh, called Talk More Talk, more about the solo Beatles. And we're going to be talking about the White Album, whether it was their peak or past their peak. We had done a podcast on that subject, uh, I think when, when Steve Marinucci was the third person before he left and Darren joined. And I don't even remember what I thought then. So, uh, I, and, I, I, and I also, we haven't discussed it, so I don't know if we all agree. I hope we disagree a little because it's more interesting. Why don't we start with Ken? Um, y- you actually had proposed the the topic, so what do you what do you think? Their well, peak? For, first of all, when we did this earlier with Steve, it was what was the Beatles at their peak, not necessarily the White Album. But um, yeah, this is something that's so much fun to discuss with fans because we all have different opinions. And the fascinating thing about studying the Beatles, one of the most fascinating, is how they constantly evolved and grew from album to album, and. I think, in particular, I like this topic because in recent years, in recent decades, the Revolver album has really gotten so much praise, praise that it maybe didn't have as much before. And um, the Sgt. Pepper album, for ever since its release, has been called the greatest rock album of all time. Some people now are taking that down a peg, and Revolver is the number one album. I'm just saying some people. We all have different opinions here. But I think that a lot of people now sometimes view the period of 66 and 67 as being the Beatles when they were at their creative peak. And that's why we're having this discussion. Because um, this was the album that followed Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour. And to me, the Beatles were constantly growing as artists. And I think that because of the fact that the, the White Album was such an eclectic mix of music. Not that the Beatles weren't always eclectic from the very beginning. You can go back to their earliest records and they're doing stuff like Till There Was You, and they used to perform Somewhere Over the Rainbow in concert. I mean, the Beatles were always very diversified in all their musical styles, but I think they went as far as they could possibly go in that direction with the White Album. You've got such a mix of styles there that you can't find on any other record since then, as far as I'm concerned, or up to that point. You'll never find an album, and of course, the fact that this was a double album was an advantage, too, because they could do a lot more with it. But when you talk about hard rock, like Helter Skelter, 
and dance hall music like Honey Pie, going into something like Revolution Number no. 9, which I know is Alan's forte here. He can do hours on Revolution Number no. 9. <laughs> and um, everything like country music with Don't Pass Me By and Rocky Raccoon, the folk music that they were doing at the time, which was a little bit different than, say, the Rubber Soul stuff, because a lot of it was one beetle alone. It has a different feel and a different vibe when you've got John doing Julia alone and Paul doing Blackbird alone. And then you've got other stuff on there, like a good fun rocker, like back in the USSR in there, a mixture of Chuck Berry and the Beach Boys. And um, Obla Di Obla Da, which was influenced by reggae. And you've got all these different styles, blues, your blues. I mean, I defy anybody in this room to come up with anything more diversified, packed together like this, other than the White Album. And I think they really stretched their creativity. They were always creative. How can you not even look at, like, Strawberry Fields Forever, which many people look at as being, you know, their greatest recording or greatest, uh, you know, overall achievement because there's so many things going on with that song. But just as a body of work, the White Album, to me, represents even more of a growth than where they were before. And I realize some people might disagree with that, but that's my opinion on the subject. And you're sticking to it. Yes. <laughs> hey, Darren. I think this topic can um, go many different ways depending on the level of fandom we're talking about. We're all hardcore Beatle fans here. So probably few of you, I'm assuming this, few of you probably think of the White Album as being the Beatles past their peak or even how could you even think that way? How could, how could that be, you know, the case? But I think if you were a, 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 a passive Beatle fan, and of course the era, uh, it depends on um, what era you're hearing the White Album. Are you hearing it when it was brand new in 1968, or are you hearing it after the fact? You could, if you compared it to Sgt. Pepper, think, gee, they're running out of ideas. Sgt. Pepper was this ornate, very elaborately packaged, uh, very elaborate sounding album that even though it wasn't a concept album, seemed to have some sort of continuity going through it. Now, here in the U.S., we got Magical Mystery Tour to kind of hold us over in the middle, the album. Not the case in the U.K., you got a movie and an EP, but not an album. So now you're going nearly a year and a half later, and then suddenly this white thing comes out. Oh, was it two virgins with a white sleeve over it? You know? Uh, Two Virgins had just been released, a controversial album cover. Could the White Album be that John and Yoko album with a a generic sleeve on it? The White Album, plain. And when you listen to it, maybe the people listening to it for the first time or someone that's not a hardcore Beatle fan might have looked, gee, they they sound so, so disjointed and they're not on the same page with one another and they're all throwing ideas against the wall and... Uh, seeing what sticks, and it's a hodgepodge, and uh, you know what? I bet you, bet you they're washed up. Bet you they're running out of ideas now. We all know, as uh, the hardcore fans who have <coughs> studied this album, not just now, but for years and years, that that's not the case. I don't believe it is at all. If anything, we're at a transition point with the White Album where they may not be past their peak creatively, I still think they're at their peak creatively, okay? But there seems to be a little bit of a a debate on exactly what was going on within the Beatles. Perhaps they're past their peak as a band, as a functioning unit, as a business, as a a group of friends uh, not getting along as well anymore because this guy was flirting with his girlfriend and the bond of several years earlier was cracking apart. So perhaps they will pass their peak as a as a as a uh, as a pack of as a posse of friends, but they I don't think by any means will they pass their peak artistically. Although perhaps some people might have thought that in looking at ornate versus plain, cohesive versus disjointed, gee, you know, they seem to have something something seems to have gone wrong with the with the band. So I hope that made sense. It's kind of mm. like. What were people thinking in 68 versus now? What is a hardcore Beatle fan that would find pleasure in listening to an album of the four of them belching, uh, as opposed to a passing fan who 
you know, doesn't think the sun rise, su- uh, rises and sets on the Beatles like some of us do. Okay. Um, I have, in a way, a problem with even the concept of whether a particular album was the Beatles' peak, because basically every single album sequentially was the peak of what they had achieved up to that point. So Pepper was the peak in 1967, this was the peak in 1968, and Abbey Road was the peak in 1969, the one exception, of course, being Let It Be. And um, I think Let It Be is the only album of theirs that I think isn't the peak. And I think I might also feel differently about that if they had released the Glyn Johns mix, where it would have been what it was intended to be, to borrow from their advertising line at the time. But it didn't come out in the Glyn Johns mix. It came out in a mix with stuff lathered over it that they had no part in. I mean, really only a few songs, but it's enough to kind of ruin the concept as a whole. You know, Long and Winding Road and uh, even Across the Universe, a song which I love. Um, Don't love it in the version that's on Let It Be uh, because of what had been done to it. Uh, so Let It Be is a special case, sort of like with a, an asterisk, but um, I think basically at every point they arrived at was their peak because they continue to do better and better. Uh, the White Album is, you know, there's been a lot of talk during this weekend that's been very enlightening, I think, um, for me about the variety of things the Beatles did on each album, and it's true. I don't think it's quite like the variety they they did on this. I mean, even if only because this thing has 30 songs on it. 31 if you count, can you take me back? And, you know, that gives them a lot more leeway to be eclectic. Um, But I think this goes beyond eclectic. In the other world where I live, the classical music world, back in, say, the 18th century, there was this concept of a thing called a summa, S-U-M-M-A, more or less a summary, but a little grander than that, works like the Art of Fugue by Bach, uh, even the Goldberg variations, are really summa works. And what that means is that in those pieces, Bach basically decided that in writing Art of Fugue, he was going to show every possibility of what you can do in a fugue. Uh, Goldberg variations too it was sort of a monster set of keyboard variations that touches on basically every kind of a variation you can have you know and there there were a lot of different descriptions you know the octave at the fifth blah 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 what the Beatles were doing here it seems to me and obviously they probably never heard of a sumo or cared but it looks to me like they were looking at the entire history of 20th century music, particularly pop music, and giving us a bit of everything and showing that they could do it just as well as the best people in any of those genres. I mean, back in the USSR is a spectacular Beach Boys track. Well, um, Honey Pie is a, really a fantastic pastiche of that era's styles. And George Martin has a hand in this, too, because you listen to the orchestration of Honey Pie, which you can now do totally unfettered by listening to the instrumental backing track on the new set, and actually even better in the 5.1 mix, which I'm beginning to feel is like going to be my go-to mix for the White Album, because it's just such an experience. You hear George Martin's writing in Honey Pie, which was not a track I especially thought was one of their best all these years, but he has that style and that era absolutely down. You can listen to the instrumental version of it and feel like you're, uh, I think Bruce Spizer last night said any Woody Allen movie because he favors that era too, but you think about all these black and white comedies from the 30s and 40s and they all have exactly that kind of orchestral sound and if you consider all of George Martin's orchestrations throughout this album which again the 5.1 clarifies and the new mixes clarify at least for me more than I'd ever thought much about them George Martin is giving you almost a summa of of orchestrational styles and uh, you know there's Piggies is kind of neo baroque. Mm. Uh, the middle of Good Night is kind of a little baroque too. Uh, but the outside parts of Good Night are, you know, thoroughly sort of um, romantic film music kind of thing. Not not so much romantic music as such. 
all kinds of things. You you listen to the scoring, you know, that that he's done, even whether it's just for brass or strings or whatever. There's a whole array of things going on, and and we think of George Martin as not being quite as present or important to the Beatles in the White Album, and yet that contribution he made and made spectacularly. So if we're talking about was this the Beatles peak up to that point? Yeah, absolutely. I love Sgt. Pepper. I, a lot of the time, think of Sgt. have thought of Sgt. Pepper as my favorite album of all, but yet, you know, listening closely to a thing like this new release makes me think a bit differently, and I suspect that that's going to happen when Abbey Road comes out next year, too. <laughs> I mean, I already think that in a way. I mean, you listen to side two of Abbey Road, it's just the most incredible thing. So uh, just a question. So you're not of the opinion in recent years about Revolver? Because a lot of people are pointing to that now, and a lot of surveys, rock surveys, they're looking at Revolver as not only the Beatles' best album, but the best album of all time. Uh, no. Um, I thought that Revolver was the best, al best thing the Beatles had ever done up to August 1966. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, it's possible also that a lot of people... Some people, it, 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 Revolver's benefiting from a Sgt. Pepper backlash. You know, I believe that's a true. lot of yes. uh, Sgt. Pepper, Sgt. Pepper, Sgt. Pepper. Oh, you know what? I like Revolver. You know, I'm, you know I mean, and Revolver, that, catch, that snowballs. Revolver has them doing a lot of things for the first time. Hmm. And so there's that. But, you know, actually every album had them doing a lot of things for the first time. Um, they never did Honey Pie before. It's not quite like their version of Tilda Was You. I mean, even though that's... No, but when I'm 64, it, isn't that same that's old? That's true to a great degree. Hmm. But Honey Pie goes much farther, I think. They definitely never did anything like Revolution 9. I, you'll admit that, right? I mean, oh, yes. <laughs> although we could say that Tomorrow Never Knows with all those tape loops. Right. Going, you know, it, um, I, so, yeah, Revolver had, had the tape loops for the first time. It had uh, a lot of the sort of electronic things and George Harrison's Indian music influence because it was a sitar on Rubber Soul, but it wasn't Indian music. Right. Love You Too was Indian music. So, yeah, I mean, it was definitely a high watermark, but I think each album after it, except Let It Be, surpassed it. <laughs> <laughs> but Let It Be, in a way, like you said before, it's an asterisk. It's, yeah. you know, like, uh, uh, this is not... That's a, why I said in the low voice, because yeah, it was it's, an asterisk. <laughs> I mean, maybe this isn't a great example. It's, to a much lesser extent, like Led Zeppelin's Coda album. Just kind of came at the end as a little, if anyone's familiar with Coda, uh, which came out after they broke up, but... While I'm listening to the two of you, I, I, in my head, my opinions and, are changing and new ideas are popping up. I'm thinking that the Beatles were at their peak as a, as a, as a functioning band, uh, and they're coming into their peak also as individual artists at this point. Clearly, George Harrison was, you know, the pressure cooker. The lid was now, now coming off, you know, couldn't keep it down anymore. I don't know... If, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make the assumption that John and Paul were writing at a rate that maybe was topped what they had done in the past. Perhaps the downtime in India gave them all the opportunity to just pump songs out one right after another. Uh, I think McCartney was setting the stage for grand works like Abbey Road, which I always sort of thought of it being a little more Paul's album, as it turned out, especially side two. Uh, and then even Ringo is now at the point where he can contribute uh, a song that holds up. So they were definitely still at their peak as a functioning band, but they were climbing, I think is my point, as individuals. They weren't at their peak yet. They were going up there. They were finding their own individuality. Just, uh, I want to ask a question because you hear about when they went to India, they came back with how many songs altogether? 30? Something like that? Uh, even was, more. Probably more. Was that I mean, their most prolific? Because even still, from 63 up to, well, 66, they only had Revolver. But most of the time, they still had two albums. Two albums worth of material. Granted, some cover versions, too. But was this, like, their most prolific time in 68, do you think? I mean, it, it seems to be. We don't, we don't know the songs that they may have had that they didn't record and we didn't hear. Mm. Um, but we get the impression that until 
the time of the White Album. They were turning up in the studio with songs part written and finished in the studio, or you know, uh, whereas here the songs are mostly finished. I mean, a few were finished in the studio or had like Revolution uh, had its final verse added in the studio, mm. and uh, you know, things changed obviously. But oh yeah, it's it's uh, the most prolific period that we know of. That, that I can think of. It would probably be that. I would think for Paul individually and John individually, their most prolific period. Well, and George because too. some of the past was, they were kind of working here and there together. I get the impression they were writing completely, I could be, again, wrong, uh, in India. Uh, they were sort of in their own little bungalows writing by themselves. And I also think George going to India, studying under the Maharishi, coming right off his... Uh, learning the sitar with Ravi Shankar, that helped plant. Really, I do not garden. So after you've planted the seeds, you... Thank you. George was germinating at that time. Uh, yeah, and going to India was really the plant food that made, you know, that helped push George and helped him blossom. Yeah. I mean, George came with, with seven songs that we know of. You know, he may have had others too, but if you consider just what's on the Isher demos and the White Album itself, it, that that comes to seven. During the Let It Be period, I think he probably played them more than seven. Um, so I think he was, until this point, a little intimidated by Lennon and McCartney. I mean, when you when you look at his first song, Don't Bother Me, I've always liked that song. To me, it's a perfectly good song. But you look in his book, I Me Mine, and his comments about it is, I, I don't know if it's a good song or even if it's a song at all. Well, it's obviously a song, and it, I don't know, it's not a bad song. It's, I like it. It's a great song. Yeah, I think yeah, so. I um, but you, you just sort of get the feeling, unless he's being self-effacing for the sake of it, which wasn't typically his way, you get the feeling that early on he was a bit intimidated. I mean, they must have said to him when he demoed, you know what to do, that, you know, this isn't good enough, we're not going to do it. Um, and, you know, I think he's just beginning at this point in his life to feel that he's coming into his own as a composer and that his songs are good. He had three on Revolver. He had, you know, Within You, Without You. I mean, that was a little controversial because a lot of people hated it when it came out and he had the self-effacing laughter at the end. Uh, and all that, but now, now he's coming with seven songs, and none of them are Indian flavored, really. Hmm. So uh, it's kind of it's it, it shows. I mean, to me, it, it just makes me feel like he's just decided that I I don't have to be second place to Lennon and McCartney anymore, or third place, depending how you look at it. Do you think there was any moment when George went home and started complaining to Patty? John's taking up eight minutes with Revolution 9, and I can't get not guilty on the album? Well, and let's see here now. While Honey Pie is a minute of dent, I could, I, you, they could have recorded this other song of mine. Well, I mean, if we're going to fantasize about what they might have gone home and said, I would say that he probably went home and said, wow, I wish I'd thought of that Revolution number 9. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, as... Uh, Mark Lewison said um, at one of these panels uh, recently, uh, maybe it was yesterday, it's only been a couple of days, it seems like a week, mm. um, <laughs> that he, he felt that uh, Not Guilty was something Ju George knew wasn't going to get on the album because it basically airs a lot of his grievances, but he just wanted to make them work on it for 102 takes <laughs> as, as a way of sort of rubbing their face in it, you right. know, and, and, and sort of knew it wasn't going to be there, but, you know. At and, the same and, time, you know, Giles Martin has been saying that uh, he remembers when people would talk to his father and say, oh, I love the White Album, and he would kind of grimace because he felt like he wasn't the teacher anymore in, in the classroom, and maybe the, the reins had been loosened and the, you know, the Beatles were having more freedom to do what they wanted to do in the studio. And so I think maybe some fans might feel that the album is a bit more liberating that way. Yeah, so that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're loving this album and fascinated by it. I'm sure George Martin, of course, was used to working in a certain way with a band that took maybe more direction to come up with something that sounded a certain way 
and it all got thrown out when the White Album sessions began. It was going to be a completely new uh, handbook. In fact, there's not going to be a handbook. We're just going to... Here, here, I have all these songs. Let's start here with page one, and we'll make our way. I want to record all of these. It, that's not how any of the Beatle albums before that went, and it was probably a way that George Martin preferred to work, that now he found himself in a situation where... Oh, boy, this is not going to be... This is going to be... This is going to be different. Okay, but already by the time of Revolver, they're coming in and saying, I want to sound like the Dalai Lama on a mountaintop, you know, mm. and... Uh, you know, even that alone typically isn't the way a pop producer and pop group worked. You know, much more typical of the way a pop producer and pop group worked is, here, boys, I, I have this wonderful song, How Do You Do It? You will record it, and that will be your single. Mm -hmm. And a group would record it, and that would be their single. The Beatles rebelled against that immediately. Jerry and the Pacemakers didn't rebel against it. But, you know... Still, early on, you know, there, there may have been more of a, well, definitely was more of a conventional producer group dynamic, except that the Beatles were pretty headstrong from the start. Yep. And by the time of Revolver, um, you know, he may say that he lost the classroom on the White Album in the sense that when he went on vacation for a week, it didn't even matter to them. You know, they just carried on. They knew what they wanted to do, um, and, uh, and they did it. And, uh, but, you know, I, I bet they could have done that as early as Revolver. They could have done it during Pepper. I mean, in Pepper, he was, you know, he was very instrumental in, in, in bringing some of their visions, particularly John's, to fruition by, you know, the orchestration of A Day in the Life and uh, the idea of taking the calliope tape and slicing it up and throwing it up in the air and then re-splicing it and, you know. And, and making a track out of that, but and within you, without you, or the orchestration, the orchestration on that. On that. Yeah. But of course, there's a lot of orchestration on the White Album, as we, we were yeah. saying. So um, that part of his job has always been there. The the part of him being the boss, teacher, producer. I think that began eroding a bit earlier than the White Album. Even though he says, I lost the classroom during the White Album, I, th I think it really goes back earlier. Hmm. It's just my theory. Can I go back to Revolver for a second? Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say I think one of the reasons why Revolver has gotten all the praise that it has in recent years is because um, ever since the CDs came out in 1987, a lot of people who were brought up on the American albums were now getting used to the way it came out in England right. and Revolver had three more tr tracks on it than it did in America and um, when you listen as it was released in England and you see the comparison between Rubber Soul and Revolver, it's such a stark contrast. It's like, to me, the greatest creative leap they ever took on an album. Mm. So that really impresses a lot of people when they heard that and maybe Sgt. Pepper wasn't as great a leap from Revolver to some people. Hmm. And also, for some fans that don't really go for very produced albums, very layered albums, they like the simplicity more of the White Album, or Revolver, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Although there's a lot of complexity still in Revolver. Definitely. But um, that's just how I feel. Okay, so you feel Revolver is their peak? No. <laughs> I kind of agree with you. Oh, okay. I think they got better and better and better. Okay. I have an idea. Um, you're talking about what follows uh, the White Album, and I am a Revolver fan, I'll admit to that. But you look at the individuals and uh, Paul and what they were doing after the White Album, uh, which never came out as a Beatle album. And Paul was doing um, Maybe I'm Amazed, and George had an entire album's worth of stuff, and John was doing his psychologist. Uh, oriented music and it was taking a different direction and you could put a pretty good album together and even Ringo like you said before was was coming up with a, a tune or two that, that could uh, stand its own on its own and uh, that could have been the next Beatles album because that those were the songs that they were working on mm -hmm. it, it, it may not be the white album for its total uh, you know uh, variety, but it had some darn good songs, and maybe that would have been it. You mean like instead of the White Album? 
Uh, well, well, no, I'm thinking like in, or after Abbey after, Road. After, well, I'm thinking Abbey Road doesn't happen necessarily, uh, or maybe not in that order. You know, I like the Fab Four free for all guys uh, yeah. presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Were you, you with that, that panel? The Did Fab Four for no? Oh, okay. Well, they took they exactly were, that yeah. <laughs> that perspective, sort of alternative universe where. There's no, this no, no, a, something. There's an, there's another, another, another podcast. Uh, 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 but, so, yeah, that other podcast. Else, else <laughs> right. And valid. Probably. I mean, at, at the, this point, <clears throat> I mean, really, until their breakup, probably anything they would have come up with would have been valid one way or another. I mean, there are a lot of directions they could have gone, you know, and they could have continued in in the same direction as Pepper, but with new material, new ways of doing it and whatever, and, it, and we probably would have thought it was great, you know, because they were just clicking on, you know, all cylinders during the period that they were working together. Um, and even as they were falling apart. Uh, it's one thing that, the, I think this, another thing that the, the reissue of the White Album with all the outtakes and everything tells us is, uh, you know, they were making choices, and the choices they were making were, you know, what will work best here. And there's always all kinds of possibilities. You kind of very rarely hear one of their outtakes that is completely different, and you think, yeah, they should have released that one instead of the one they released. I mean, they had a knack for coming up with exactly the right way to do it. A lot of outtakes I like. I like hearing, but I don't necessarily think that they would be better than the released versions. I think that the decisions they made were, were the right decisions. I think Alternative Universe, the, the phrase that you came up with is, is interesting. Hmm. Uh, how many people, um, this is kind of like a, a, a related offshoot of this main topic, how many people went into the, uh, the release of the 50th anniversary box set and, and into this whole uh, intensive White Album period that we're all in right now, thinking the Beatles were breaking up at the time of the White Album. That's what everyone has said. And now that the box set's out, Giles Martin has said in interviews, no, they weren't. They were having a ball in the studio. They were still getting along. This wasn't the end, uh, at least, you know, not to what we'll hear, what we are now hearing in the box set. What do you make of, of the fact, we're talking about the Beatles at their peak, where were they at internally at that point? Were they, you know, were they, uh, were they breaking up or beginning to break up at this point, like we've always thought? Or perhaps we have to rethink that whole thing and perhaps the issues were happening more in, in the boardroom than in the studio and that just ended up coming through in 1969 then. Yeah, I, I mean, I think... A lot of what you're saying is is probably what what happened. You know, I mean, we can't know totally, but um, yeah. When Giles Martin started saying this, um, I, and I reviewed this for this new set for the Wall Street Journal, and I sort of take up that you know that there are a lot of agendas in this release, and Giles Martin's agenda is to show that everything we thought we knew about the Beatles' breakup starting here isn't true. And I said basically, you know, that's going to be a hard sell because. John always said that the beginning of the breakup was there. Or I don't know about always, but he said so, you know, in the Rolling Stone interview. He's the one who described it as four, you know, individual musicians and session backing players. Paul, to this day, and including in the White Album book uh, that comes with the set, calls it the Tension Album. Okay. Uh, George Harrison, <laughs> well, just listen to Not Guilty. You can hear what's going on with him. Ringo quit. Mm -hmm. um, partly because you know they're, they're, now it's being soft pedaled about you know him not pl playing well, which he has been saying. But you know we've always heard that it was also because he would come in and find that Paul had wiped one of his tracks and played drums on it, and he felt a little inessential and, and probably a little offended by that because it's sort of someone else doing his job. And Emmerich quit during the sessions exactly because he said that the bickering was too much for him. I mean, mm. he'd been hanging around them for a few years, and this suddenly was too much. And then George Martin going on vacation week. So there's an awful lot of evidence to suggest that they were not behaving 
in a very friendly way in the studio. Now, what Giles says and what the release seems to bear out is that when the tapes were rolling, they were having a great time and they were joking with each other and, um, you know, cooperating, having fun, all that. And that's true. Jeff Emmerich, in his memoir, Hmm. which is very problematic because we know of a lot of stuff in the memoir that actually wasn't even Jeff's memories. It was other engineers at Abbey Road's memories, uh, sometimes with stories in which, you know, Jeff in the book is taking part in something where he wasn't even there. It wasn't really his memory. And uh, so that makes that book very difficult to use as a source. But since the White Album was such an emotional thing for him, and not emotional enough for him to quit. Hmm. I think we have to take it seriously when he says, when the tapes were rolling, they were great, but when the tapes were not rolling, they were just, you know, it was just hell being in there. You know, so in a way, uh, even though, you know, he died a, a little over a month ago, he was, in his book still contradicts Giles's observation there about how they were getting along the whole time. And yet to counter that, Years ago, when I interviewed Ken Scott, when his book came out, he said that he had a blast making it he with them. And Chris Thomas says the same thing. Same thing. Yeah. And Ringo will say, you know, he enjoyed the White Album more because they were more of a band then. You know, comparing that to but Sergeant he Pepper. Quit. But even <laughs> still, but I mean, Ringo said it. Yeah, okay, he said <laughs> it's it. still his words. Uh, here's the thing: um, it's very possible that they were having the horrible time that everybody describes until Jeff quit and that was like a wake up call for them like okay we got it we have to get it together here and you know possibly the reason that Ken Scott who came in to replace Jeff Hmm. um, and Chris Thomas who was there from the start but you know took over more as the sessions went on uh, maybe the, the reason they felt that the sessions went better is because exactly because of Jeff leaving you know, maybe they decided to rein it in a bit, fight on their own outside Abbey Road. Hmm. You know, I think the disagreements that were popping up between the four of them were were, were increasing, but were still rather new to them. Uh, they were getting older. They were adults. Enter Yoko. Enter Apple. The entire business. Their world had changed. Uh, Brian Epstein was uh, Epstein had passed just a year earlier, less than that even, depending on what point sixty-eight we're talking. No manager, new business. They're the business head, the head of the big corporation. Here comes a girlfriend. All right, my girlfriend's going to come to the studio too now. The whole dynamic has changed. And um, perhaps at first they uh, were the type of friends that could forget the stresses once their instruments they had their instruments and they were ready to play. I mean, how many times, you know, have you been able to get along with somebody that you really don't care for when you're doing something you love maybe with that person? And then when you're finished, the, the uh, you know, you see the, the bad side, the warts come and all on this particular person and you just can't, you know, you can't, I can't be around that person till the time comes. And eventually then it all wears thin. And as we know, they were on borrowed time. Uh, and did break up uh, at some point over the course of, you know, a year or so after the album came out, the White Album. Mm-hmm. How many people in here are still best friends with the person they were best friends with in high school? Now magnify that. <laughs> it's, that's fine, because it's still a mind, you know, it's just a handful. Now you're in a band where you're in a band together, sitting literally on top of it, I mean... It, it, yeah, it, and it, it still is like that. Yeah, even it, it, different, it but... To break up eventually. Yeah. You know, how many people can stay married once to one person? Or right. <laughs> I mean, I know that I would... I would... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would revise that comment. Rather <laughs> than your high school friends, let me ask you this question. How many of you are still close with your siblings? Because in truth, that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. They were brothers, and it was them against the world. So they had a very different construct interpersonally than you would with your best friend from high school. It's more like your brother or your older brother. I mean, it's a very different situation. And 
in psychology we have a compendium of stress, and it gives a numerical number, a numerical number, you know, it gives a number to every <laughs> stressful event occurring in your life. So look at the Beatles at that time. Uh, death in the family is one of the big ones. Moving, new relationship, new project at work, new business. You start adding those numbers out, and these guys would have a stress level that would be un make, would make Trump go crazy. Oh wait, that's already happened. <laughs> and I, I think I, I think that had a lot to do with their relationship at that time. If you listen to what Chris Thomas said earlier, he was talking about when there were arguments or. It, in the studio, he seemed to remember it being more about Apple than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Not so much about the songs that they were doing. Right. So, but still, at that point, when they had their guitars and there's and Ringo's behind the drum kit, that all went away. Right. Famous. Maybe not a year later as much, but at that point in 1968, there was still enough of the glue there holding them together uh, that they were able to put this. Um, I don't mean it to uh, put forward this this front of what was going on, but deep down in their heads, things were changing, and you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, the other thing that's all the, based on what John said in the Rolling Stone interview about the you know four guys with the other three as the backing band was, you know, to a large degree the way they always worked. You know, I mean, maybe not. At the very beginning, you know, they when they were sort of, but but still, it was the the person who wrote the song and sang the song was the front man, you know, and and the others were contributing what they contribute, and it, it's not as if uh, in when you listen to the again the outtakes in this set and then the finished version, you know, I'll plug the five point one version again, <laughs> um, it's not as if it sounds like one person, the head of that song, is saying, okay, now you play this, and you play that, and you play that. It might have been the case for Paul songs in some way, because he, he tended to, you know, do that more, like, as we mm. know, with Hey Jude and, you know, George's guitar and all that. But it sounds like they're all contributing ideas. And Ringo is contributing the kind of drumming he wants to do, mm -hmm. John is playing, George is playing... You know, those those things where they're all together are really cooking as a band, right. just as in the early days. Not just as in the early days, because there's a level of competence at this point that they didn't really have in the early days. I mean, I love I Saw Her Standing There, but I'm not sure that the band that recorded I Saw Her Standing There could 15 minutes later have recorded Helter Skelter. No. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, a totally different um, level of mastery of their instruments, of the studio, of what can be done, you know, about how to translate what you're imagining in, into the sound you're getting on the tape. I'm always blown away by Paul's bass on I Saw Her Standing There and thinking... <laughs> Wow, he was playing like this in 1963. In that early wow. Line. But it's really the bass line for Chuck Berry's Talking About You. Right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> kid. Yeah, I, uh, just Sorry. something you said was just uh, <coughs> something that I want to get your view on is that, you know, when I was coming up learning about the Beatles, I read in, in you know, many books, none by authors are here, that... Um, <laughs> that by the time they got to the White Album, that it was, they were no longer collaborating. It was like John and the backup band, Paul and the backup band. You know, it was like that. Just because I haven't heard the box set yet. Has this changed your view on that? Do you think they were more collaborative than were initially given credit for? Or, or what? Uh I'm with you. That's how I thought. Mm -hmm. I, and I, and, I, and now, now I'm thinking... All the years I've been playing these songs on WFUV, I'm like, I hope I didn't say that that was Paul alone in the studio all these years, because he clearly isn't. Therefore, I was wrong. And i got to really like rethink the whole thing. But from what I've heard, and I have the box set, uh, but I haven't opened it yet, but I've heard it's been a little of uh, radio specials, a little on... Uh, 
I, I finally just figured out how Spotify works a couple of days ago. All right? My Excuse kids me. had a ball but making fun. You know, you're going to, Dad, don't do too much. You're going to short out the uh, electric, electric, electrical one. Uh, but I've been listening to pieces on Spotify and hearing this and that and then here, and it sounds to me like I think we've got to rethink at least, we've got to rethink at least the fact that maybe all what we thought was individual and solo might not have been. I don't know. About I, that, didn't, I didn't know John was in the studio during I Will until a couple of weeks ago. Okay. I always was under the impression I Will was Paul down the hall in another studio. Uh, and but, maybe that did happen, but maybe it happened, you know, I'm thinking it happened more than it actually did. Well, maybe I'm look, just confused, but that's. You look at songs like course. Julia or, or Blackbird where it's just one Beatle and nothing else, and you're, you're going to think, well, the other Beatles had nothing to do with it. Yeah, but today they just said it to lunch. All of sitting in the studio listening to John working on Julia. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. And yet when you hear mm-hmm. Julia all these years. Right, so I think it's just John. Right. right. Mm-hmm. And they didn't know Ringo might have been sitting on the top step on a, going up, you know. Right. I'm trying to tie together your earlier point about the difference between casual fans who might have said, oh, yeah, well, it's, it's kind of over, and hardcore fans who, like uh, Alan and uh, Ken mentioned, each one was a new peak, yeah. a new. So. Um, we know that there were fans that thought when Revolver came out, oh, that's not for me, you know, I'm I'm done with the Beatles. And then after Let It Be, I know when I was in high school, people say, what are you still listening to the Beatles for, you know? It's, it's over, man. So what makes us as hardcore fans right <laughs> and then wrong? Oh, because we are. <laughs> in the groove. Yeah. In the groove. Uh, you know why? Because this wouldn't be happening. Yeah. You know I what I mean? It's a generally accepted um, proposition that the Beatles are the zenith of Western Civ. <laughs> 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 I mean, th- uh, I love Chicago. There's not going to be a symposium on Chicago 2. But that doesn't mean Chicago 2 is not a great album. Yeah. Look at what's happening here. You know, and look that, you know, uh, th- there could be another one for Abbey Road, one of these, or there could be a. 60th anniversary White Album box set where you get every single note that exists, right? Uh, I hope I'm around for the 75th anniversary box set. I, but anyway. When we um, finally get the 27-minute Helter Skelter. Ken's line at dinner last night was great. Ken Dashow, he said, there, I, there was nobody in my high school wearing Artie Shaw t-shirts. Right. Right. There are kids yeah. today wearing rubber sole and revolver t shirts. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no Artie yeah. Shaw t shirts when you use the popular I happen to have an Artie Shaw t shirt. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's a young individual here who was at uh, one of the, some of the uh, symposiums this morning. Back there, Danny knows more about the yeah. rules. He listens to my show. Every yeah. little thing. <laughs> it's argue. Yes, really. It's arguable yeah. that he listens to all your shows and, yeah. and hmm. reads the books and sees the shows, and uh, that's that's where yeah we'll the see future the lies. Anniversary uh, box set and, and, and all that. Does anyone have any other other questions, other observations, even if they go off a little bit the 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 main topic about things that you've uh, that have struck you about the White Album? I will we'll keep back here. Just wait into some controversial waters myself. I wait into some controversial waters myself. I love the Beatles. I fell in love with them when I was 12 years old and made them here around that time frame. And as great as they are, they, they couldn't make a bad album, an entirely bad album. But I'm, I'm of the opinion that prior to the White Album, there was a wholeness of an entity called the Beatles that emanated beauty from the four of them together. It made songs one after another, eight days a week, uh, for no one. So many, so many songs, um, She Loves You was mentioned, so, so many, that when the White Album came to be, if there could be such a thing as a, as a weak Beatles album, I think it's hard for us as lovers of them to feel don't say anything bad about somebody in the family. <laughs> you, can't, you can't really say that. The very fact that there is a, is a session today called Wasn't There Pete? Wasn't There Pete? Or After It? There's so many people that wanted to attend it. shows that it's in our mind. And I feel the views are great. They've got, there are beautiful, beautiful things on the White Album. 
but for me there are many weak points. Not bad, but weaker than the real glowing heart, sun, smashing, pounding love and heart that the Beatles songs prior to that. Mm -hmm. It's so, 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 so great. If the Beatles being the Beatles can come up, come up with a white album and, and it sounds quite good, but I'll just, I'm just saying, you can see I'm not complaining some controversy. <laughs> well, it, it is, it, if the Beatles attempted to do the White Album in 1966, or if another band attempted to do the White Album at any time like that, in most instances, they would have been probably told, no, take it easy, calm down, it's going to be a single album, we don't need Wild Honey Pie, Paul. Uh, and John, okay, you want Revolution 9? Can you cut it down to two minutes, maybe? Mm. Get that end part where the tapes are rewind and use that, I like that. We'll loop and make it a dance song. Um, I think by 1968, the Beatles were their own separate thing that what they want, that was what was going to happen. And to some, you could say that the White Album is all over the map and disjointed and doesn't have the song one right after another, like you were saying earlier on. You know, you were tripped up by things like, I keep bringing up Wild Honey Pie. Uh, or maybe you don't like Obladi Oblada. Or what Sean did. Uh, you know, I don't know. It listens, and it could be perceived as a all-over-the-place uh, album, and it is, but that's the beauty of it. Right. Now, I've often, through the years, looked at other bands who've done double albums, and some, from time to time I'll hear people say Exile on Main Street was the Rolling Stones' wide album. More recently, Wilco's second album, Being There, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Wilco, but Being There was their White Album, and in a way it was. They were all over the map because they were trying to prove on their second album that they weren't just an alt-country band. So they were all over the place on that, on that record. And that speaks volumes for the importance of the White Album, that people are going, it's a double album, and man, there's a lot happening on it. It's their White Album. I'm just very proud and happy for the Beatles that they made that last search toward the beauty they had had before the Abbey Road. That's the last okay. thing. And uh, in the comparison between... I guess I'm saying two things. Between, um, I saw her standing there and Helter Skelter. One is more technically advanced, maybe, to Helter Skelter, but which is a greater song? They're both good songs. They're both great. <laughs> what, what were you going to say? I just wanted to see if everyone could raise their hand if the White Album oh. is your favorite Beatle album. Who says Abbey Road? No, the whole album, the whole thing. <laughs> Who says Sergeant Pepper? Who says all of them? Yeah. Okay. All right, but there's nothing wrong with having a favorite. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a favorite, I don't think. But I have a least favorite. Now, uh, some <laughs> let it be. <laughs> well, uh, uh, if you, if you t maybe take let it be out of the equation, because let it be ended up not being what it could have been and what it should have been. It ended up being, you know, Phil Spector's, you know, Phil Spector's interpretation of what might have been. What about Let It Be Naked? No, I think they should have just done the um, original John's. mix. Of the, of the albums from Abbey Road Glenn back. Right. And I guess you could think, talk about uh, the, the UK albums now maybe more so than the American. I always kind of thought Beatles for Sale might have been mm -hmm. their weakest album. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I love mm -hmm. But there you go. It's a great album. That I, you know, I play bands on WFUV that wish that they could stink like uh, Beatles for Sale. I didn't say that out loud. Did I? Is this recording? The, the Beatles' yeah. weakest Edith album is yeah. usually so better than most great. artists' best albums. The yeah. fact that the fact that Paul went back to George Martin in 1969 and said, we want you to come back because we want to make an album like we used to make them. What does that say about how they viewed the White Album? I think that was a response to Let It Be more than the White Album. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. But um, still, they said, we want to go back to the way we were with you. And he said, I'll do it if you all agree. Even John? Yes, even John. <laughs> Great. Doing. Right, but that was specifically a response to John saying at the beginning of the Let It Be sessions, uh, we're not going to do all that production shit, you know, we're just going to play an honest album, and well, you know, we know what happens. And, uh, John changes mind every five minutes, is what he said too. Right, there's that. <laughs>
Here's, a, here's another way of looking at maybe the let it be thing and others. Uh, I think that now that Apple is actually taking seriously the idea that they ought to be celebrating these albums by doing something more than just remastering it and putting it out as it was uh, and are clearly now pursuing a policy starting with Pepper of putting out boxes with new mixes which whether or not you like the new mixes they reveal other things than the original mixes and especially outtakes I think they're beginning I, I think as they begin to do that a lot of us listening to these recordings even those of us who pretty much had all the Beatles stuff pumped into us intravenously for like 50 years are hearing new things and yeah, yeah. reassessing the albums. I mean, I, I wasn't sure there was a point in a White Album remix because it was a pretty good mix originally. And unlike Pepper, where he was trying to do in stereo what the mono mix did, and the White Album, that wasn't necessary because I think the, mo the stereo was kind of superior mix anyway, at least in most cases. But, you know, they'll do that with Abbey Road. They'll do it with Let It Be, undoubtedly. And uh, maybe when they do it with Let It Be, and instead of hearing all the sessions on the Nagra tapes, we hear them from the, you know, four-track session masters, maybe we'll end up with a completely different way of looking at let it be, and uh, everything going on around it. I mean, I'd be surprised if Giles Martin comes out and says, you know, I, I really don't think they weren't having a good <laughs> right, time right, doing right. it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there is also plenty of, of footage and, uh, and, and recordings where they are having a good time. Uh -huh. And I think, I mean, from what I've heard, they are, you know, McCartney let this slip, which means probably deliberately. Um, in a, a recent interview, I guess mainly about Egypt Station, but that they're working on a, a new version of Let It Be. And, uh, and I spoke to their film guy, it was Jonathan, what's his name? Clyde. Jonathan Clyde. Clyde. Jonathan Clyde. Um, I ran into him at a, when, when Magical Mystery Tour came out. They had a showing in, at the uh, Paley Center in New York. And he had said, you know, I, I can't talk to you because you're the press and we're not really allowed to do that. But, so I said, okay, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. What I think you should do is you should reissue Let It Be finally as it was, but there's also so much footage of them actually having a good time that you could have an alternate cut as well that shows a different side of the Let It Be sessions and he said you know we actually are thinking about something like that um, and that's kind of what Paul was saying in that interview too that they're thinking of a, a, a revised Let It Be he didn't talk about also putting out the original but I think they kind of have to but then, then they're not does. letting it be they'd have to probably come up with a different title and well, they could go as back it was to go back to get back <laughs> but um, we have uh, about a minute or two or three. Uh, if anyone has any questions, any more questions? I was just going to make a linkage, an interesting linkage, I think, between um, the White Album, Let It Be, and Abbey Road. And, and something that interests me is Chris Thomas carried on, I was wondering if he was going to mention that, with some additional recordings, as I understand it, into February, March, April of 69. Like an old brown shoe, I think he actually played on. Uh, and the band carried on after Let It Be. It was not yeah. like it was a dead stop with George Martin coming in July. Right. Um, we've got, you know, I Want You. I Want You, She's a Heavy, right. And, uh, and there's that interesting continuum in Ballard John Yoko as well, with kind of a one, one off almost in that time frame, George Martin and Jeff Emmerich, and then back on in full with Let's Do the Let It Be. So Chris Thomas even carried on a little bit um, through that period. And, and, with the Let It Be uh, kind of sojourn. And it's an interesting linkage, band, Chris Thomas, George Martin, from the White Album through to Abbey Road. Mm -hmm. It would probably be interesting. I would think they would, you know, that was their job, this is what we do, we're Beatles, let's keep going, keep him away from me. Uh, <laughs> and till that wore thin by the end of the year, I guess. I have a question for you guys. Why do you think that they did not give Eric Clapton any credit at all for 
in those days, well, they didn't do that. Contractual. Yeah, contractual. Yeah. But, but, contractual. Uh, uh, I don't understand it yet. No credit on that album at all. I'm no sure. knew he was on it. Contractual, I'm sure. But I could also see Eric, who seemed to be, he seems to be in interview yeah. sheepish about having to be called in to play on a Beatles session, like me on a Beatles session, not caring or even saying, do me a favor, don't even put, you know. But I'm sure it was, con- it was, it was contractual because Cream was uh, on uh, with Atlantic, I believe. They were on ATCO at that time. So. Yeah, and then yeah, Harrison, yeah, and Harrison, Harrison didn't get credit on the song yeah, Badge. So, yeah. On Badge, George didn't get credit for playing the solo there. Okay, um, and should we ask? Have more questions, or are we done? Um, any more questions? Okay. Well, thanks for. Oh, thank thanks so much. For- and that was it. I hope you enjoyed our thoughts and comments on the Beatles' White Album. And whether it was the Beatles at their peak or past their peak, the uh, White Album Symposium had panel discussions on every angle of the White Album and beyond that. And I, uh, I want to thank everyone that attended the show at any time during the weekend and uh, those that came to see our panel. And just want you to know that uh, on behalf of Alan and Darren, we really appreciate all the comments and the feedback that we get here on the show, and uh, certainly those of you that came by to say hi to us, uh, whether you're a regular listener or just finding out about the show, right there at the symposium. Some contact information for Alan Cozen. You can reach him on Facebook at Alan Cozen. Also, his other page, Alan Cozen Remixed. As for Darren, he has a Facebook page called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. And you can email Darren at DarrenDeVivo at WFUV.org. Also, be sure to catch Darren on WFUV Monday through Thursday nights from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. That's Eastern Time at WFUV.org. As for me, Ken Michaels, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. You can listen to a brand new interview that I just did with Ken Mansfield. He's the former U.S. manager for Apple Records, and he just put out a brand new book called The Roof, The Beatles' Final Concert. And you soon will be able to win copies of that book on my website, on my Beatles trivia and games page, where you can win one of nine great prizes every single week and again that's at kenmichaelsradio.com don't forget to catch my new solo beatles video podcast called talk more talk we're a bi-weekly show just like things we said today and it's found on facebook tuesday nights at either 9 or 10 p.m that's eastern time with ken womack kid o'toole and tom hunyadi like us on our facebook page at talk more talk a solo beatles video podcast and catch our show live which you can also always watch later on our Facebook page, and it's also now on YouTube. And the audio of the show can be heard on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, and Google Drive. We're all over the place. To write to each of us here on Things We Said Today, our email address is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. On Twitter, you can find us at, at sign Things We Said Fab. And on Facebook at Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. So, that's it. Once again, we thank you for all your wonderful support of this show. And for Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo, I'm Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening. And we will see you next time. Next time.